of Gray Lighthouse Baptist Church here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Just want to uh, give you uh, a little update of uh, things here. Uh, I am live streaming, but you may or may not be able to tell uh, there's no one in the congregation. And we had to take some safety precautions, but we are doing well. Now, uh, originally, uh, I had stated that uh, we wouldn't have public services again until uh, December uh, 16th. But I have changed that, and I want to tell you why. I, on Wednesday of last week, I found out that uh, a person, just one person in our church, had tested positive. I was very sick last week, and uh, around Wednesday, I still had not gotten my test results back, which I was very concerned that they were going to come back positive, and which, if that would be the case, it would make things a little bit more serious uh, as to how we go forward with our services. So, with that in mind... I went ahead and canceled everything until December 16th. Now, what has happened since then? Since then, I have tested negative. The other uh, people associated with the one person that tested positive, they have all tested negative. And so everybody that I'm aware of that has been tested has tested negative. Uh, There is nobody in our church with any symptoms or signs. And so everything looks good. Now, uh, in the paperwork that I received from the doctor's office, it said that I would have to quarantine myself 14 days from the time that I was around the person who tested positive. Well, the last time he was in our congregation at a church service was during the uh, get the word before the bird, the day prior to Thanksgiving. He was there that night. Now, as all he was was from the pew to the parking lot. That's all he was. Uh, he, he wears a mask all the time. And I believe personally that that's what kept, kept everything contained and kept it from spreading was the fact that he had a mask. You must understand, a mask will not prevent you from getting it, but it will prevent you from spreading the virus. And I believe that That's one of the reasons why it didn't spread. It was contained. So we only have the one individual. Now, from the last time that he was here to this Wednesday will be 14 days. So I have decided after prayer, and believe me, agonizing prayer, thought, and consideration, I decided to reopen the church on December 9th, this Wednesday. And everybody will just meet here in the auditorium. Um, On Friday night, the RU program coming up will be Zoom. Will be Zoom over uh, the internet. And then next Sunday morning, we'll be doing everything as normal. As normal. Now, uh, there was new released information from the CDC this week, about Thursday, I believe it came out, and I I seen it on Channel 8 News, WGAL Channel 8 News, and I re-watched it a couple of times to make sure what I was hearing was correct. And the CDC has changed the length of time that you need to quarantine if you're around someone who tested positive, and you're, you're all right. If you're around somebody that tested positive, then you need to quarantine yourself for 10 days. So they actually shortened the length of time of quarantine. So instead of 14, it's 10 days. Now, either way you want to look at it, the new way or the old standard doesn't matter. We still cover the 14 days by December 9th. And I want to reiterate, there have been no cases other than the one. And like I said, that Wednesday, he was in his pew, and he was, went to the parking lot, and that was it. Um, no other, there's been no other cases. Even myself, as sick as I was, I did not have any of the major symptoms of COVID. And, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm doing a lot better. I just had a bad cold, a bad uh, 
cold, mild flu, if you want to call it that, and that's what I had been struggling with. But anyway, uh, I'm fine. I'm good to go. A number of people have been tested. They've all been coming back negative. And so as a church, I have utter confidence, the utmost confidence, that we are good to go. So if you want to come by Wednesday, feel free to do so. We'll all be meeting in the auditorium only. Now, also, since then, I've had a couple of people in here cleaning the church. I told them to really disinfect it really well, and they did because you can smell it. Uh, it, it, it has that, that, that you know, strong smell to it. But uh, it'll be good by the time Wednesday comes. And I, and I got to tell you, we did everything we could to make sure this whole place was disinfected. It was sanitized. So we're good. We're, we're good to go as far as that is. Now, let me, after saying all that, let me reiterate this. If you do not feel well, then don't come to the services. Just stay at home. Probably something I should have done last Sunday. Uh, but thank the Lord I was negative and there was nothing, no COVID there. But if you're not feeling well, you should probably stay home. And then, of course, if, if you don't feel comfortable with coming back to church just yet because we had a positive, then by all means stay at home and watch the online services. I'd encourage you not to stay home too long, but uh, that is between you and the Lord and however uh, comfortable you feel with it. Uh, but anyway, that's where we stand as a church right now. Uh, a whole lot of negatives, only that one positive. And we're f Wednesday will be 14 days past that. And so it looks like, uh, you know, we're good to go. Um, once again, Zoom for our U program this Friday. It'll be on Zoom. All right, so I know I gave you a lot of information. I hope I haven't confused you. But just remember, December 9th and forward, we'll have services like we normally do. And this is the season. We want to we wanna get together and we want to remember our Lord coming into the world. Amen? So let's take a few moments to pray. And then we'll get to right into the Word of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we just humbly bow before you this morning. And I thank you, God, that you contained the virus, Lord. I thank you, Father, that there were so many people that tested negative, including myself, Lord. I thank you, Father, that you're just an awesome and a mighty God and you do all things well. I pray, Father, you would continue to protect our church from not just COVID virus, but any type of virus that's out there, the flu, the cold, all the stuff that's going around. Father, please protect us and please keep us safe and keep us strong, Father. Help us, Lord, during this time of year to be a bold witness for you. Father, I pray for the many sick and afflicted that you would bring healing to their body. Uh, Bob and Linda, they need a healing and a special touch from you, God, and I pray that you would move mightily. John and Shirley need a special touch. I pray for Cindy to heal her shoulder and that her, her uh, test on her biopsy for skin cancer, I pray that would come back negative, Lord. I pray, Father, you'd heal Benita's hand. And Father, truly, I could keep going on and on with uh, names of folks that need healing, but I trust God that you're Jehovah Raphael, the Lord that healeth thee. I believe that you're the great physician I just ask that you would heal in a great way. Please continue to heal this one that has the COVID. Thank you that their symptoms are just mild. And I just pray for a complete healing and restoration and a mighty work uh, within that individual's life. Father, I thank you again for who you are and what you do. You're an awesome and you're a mighty God and you're worthy to be praised and I praise you and I thank you and I glorify you and I magnify your name and I ask, Lord, that you would be with me now. Speak through me and speak to every heart who will hear your word this morning. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. All right, so if you take your Bibles... Sorry, my mouth is really dry this morning. 
We're going to go to Matthew, but I guess even though nobody's here, I still need to do this. Take your Bibles out there, whoever's watching, and repeat after me. I believe that this is the Word of God. I believe every Word of God is true because it's impossible for God to lie. All right, so we're in Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, and uh, the title of the message this morning is Joseph, the unsung hero of Christmas. Joseph, the unsung hero of Christmas. I I don't believe you can really see the table in the uh, video shot. You may be able to get the top character here. Uh, which is Joseph, and then there's Mary and Jesus in that painting. I love that painting. But we're going to take a look at the fellow in this painting whose name is Joseph. Now, Joseph plays an important and vital role. And uh, he, will, he will provide for Mary. He will care for her. He'll comfort her. He'll protect her, making sure that everything goes well with this pregnancy and the delivery of the Christ child. He will then also play another vital and important role in him and Mary both raising Jesus from uh, infant uh, to adulthood. Now, it's not sure when uh, Joseph died, but it becomes evident that he wasn't alive uh, during Jesus' public ministry anyway. And when Jesus was at the cross, he gave responsibility and care for his mother. He turned that over to John the Apostle. He said, woman, behold thy son. Son, uh, John, behold thy mother. And uh, he, gave her, he gave him a responsibility over caring for her. Obviously, Joseph was not alive or that would not have happened. So we presume that somewhere uh, during Jesus' life, his dad did pass away. We know that Joseph was alive when Jesus was around 12, 13 years old because he was with him when he went into the temple. And remember the story, he got left behind and his parents came back looking for you and they're saying, what are you doing? You're driving us crazy. Where were you? What are you doing? And Jesus said, don't you know I must be about my father's business. Joseph was there. So we know that at that point of Jesus' life, he was still there. And so Joseph plays his vital role. When they go down into Egypt after Jesus is born uh, and the wise men come to visit them, and these are all things we're going to take a look at in the weeks to come, Uh, when the wise men come to visit Joseph, uh, Mary, and Jesus, uh, Herod gets jealous and he wants to kill the babies. And so once again, Joseph is told to take Jesus into Egypt and to stay there until the Lord tells him it's all right to come out. And so in that case, what do you see happening there? There there you see Joseph, he's caring for Jesus, he's protecting Jesus, he's providing for Jesus. He's doing everything that a good father would do. And so uh, when he comes out of Egypt, he takes him into the area of Galilee uh, because of one of Herod's sons that are now in control of the area. He's warned, don't take him back into Judea, take him up to Galilee. And he does that, still providing and protecting for Jesus. So Joseph plays a vital role. And while we see his his figure in the plays, uh, we see uh, him briefly in in movies and uh, Christmas cards, nobody ever talks about Joseph. And so this morning, as we really begin to kick off the Christmas season, I want to take a look at Joseph, the unsung hero. Now, Matthew's gospel is very interesting. Matthew is a gospel that was written to Jews. Matthew has many, over 60 uh, quotes from the Old Testament in his gospel. And why is that? Because what Matthew is trying to establish is that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ child. So, uh, in the first beginning of verse 1, it says, The book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It's establishing Jesus' right and lineage to the throne. In fact, the Lord takes, goes, uh, at great, goes to great lengths to prove this. He does it here through Joseph's lineage. He does it through Mary's lineage. 
uh, in Luke in, in the Gospel of Luke, proven that Jesus is a direct descendant of King David, and he uh, he has a legal right to the throne. He is the king, and so Matthew's point in his gospel is for Jews to understand that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. And so you see a lot of quotes from the Old Testament. In fact, even this morning we'll see one. So verses 1 through verse number 17 is basically establishing the genealogy and setting us up for this person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now one thing I do want to point out in the genealogy in verse 16 I want you to notice how it's worded there. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. The Bible goes to great lengths to prove of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. That when Mary was conceived, she was a virgin. That no man had had relations with her. Now here it tells us, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus. He doesn't say, like all the other names preceding it, it says, uh, so-and-so begot so-and-so, so-and-so begot so-and-so. But when it gets to Joseph, it doesn't say that. It says, Joseph, the husband of Mary. So something special happened. And so the Bible's already tipping us off to this uniqueness of Jesus Christ. All right, so now let's begin this account. We're going to look at from verses 18 through 25. The first thing we have is Joseph's dilemma. Joseph's dilemma in verse number 18. The Bible tells us, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. This is, his, this is his dilemma. This is his dilemma. What, what am I going to do? I, I'm a spouse to Mary. Now in those do days, a lot of people try to compare it to the modern day concept of being engaged. And I understand the reasoning behind that. But in Bible days, in the Jewish culture, when you were a spouse to someone, you were basically already married. And the only thing that hadn't happened was it hadn't been consummated yet. So you had, the families had come together, you had made an agreement, and you were now espoused. During the espousal time, the husband would go and prepare a place where they were going to live, and when the time was ready, the father of the groom would say, go get your bride. You say, that sounds an awful lot like the second coming of Jesus Christ. It is. It's the same imagery that Jesus uses. It's the same wording that the Apostle Paul uses in 2 Corinthians when he talks about us being a spouse to Christ. And so Joseph was a spouse to Mary. It was as good as being married. That's why they would refer to one another as husband and wife, even though it had not yet been consummated. Now with all that in mind, here comes Joseph, and he finds out that his wife Mary, or his espoused wife Mary, is pregnant. She's going to have a baby. And, she, and he's being told that it's from the Holy Ghost, that that's why. Now, any red-blooded man is going to have a problem with that story. If somebody comes to you and says, listen, I'm pregnant, but no man is the father, God is, you're going to have hard press to get anybody to believe that. And that's the dilemma that Joseph finds himself in. Look at that again, once again, because the virgin, birth, the virgin birth is always being attacked. Look at verse 18 again. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together. That means they had no sexual relationships whatsoever. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail into that because we'll be hitting on that when we talk about Mary's visitation from Gabriel and whatnot. So, uh, but the Holy Ghost overshadowed her, and that's how she conceived. I often like to think about it as in Genesis chapter 1 and the creation of the world. And it says the Spirit of God hovered 
over, over the, the deep. And that the creation week begins at that time. And this is, G, this is the Holy Spirit just hovering over Mary and bringing uh, to fruition the Christ child. Through Mary, he has his humanity. Through the Holy Spirit, he retains his deity. And somehow, God the Son gets inside Mary and is the incarnated God that is put on human flesh. He becomes incarnated. He becomes life inside of Mary. All right. Now, that's his dilemma. His dilemma is, what am I going to do? So look at Joseph's determination. His determination in verse number 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Privily, which means privately. But so what's his determination? His determination is, I'm not going to make her a public example. I'm going to put her away privately. Why? Because he loves her. First of all, the Bible tells us that Joseph is a, a just man. It says in verse 19, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, he was righteous. He was a righteous man. He was saved. Amen. He loved the Lord. He walked with the Lord. And his character and his actions proved that. He, he, he loved Mary. He did not want to humiliate her. And he had every right under the law to do a couple of different things. Under the law, he could have had her stoned because that's what the law said that you could do. You could have her stoned uh, for this immoral practice. But he, he doesn't want to do that. Uh, he could go ahead and marry her or he could put her away privately. In other words, get a... A, writing, a certificate of divorce saying, I am, I am not her husband, she is not my wife. And then she would be set free to go on her, no pun intended, her merry way. But, uh, but anyway, uh, this was his determination. Verse number 19, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Now, also, I want you to understand something about Joseph here and his decision process. He was not hasty in his decision. He put thought into it. And that teaches us something. When it comes to major life decisions, uh, we, we need to really uh, never make them in haste. We should really prayerfully consider what does God want us to do. We should consider what does the Scripture say? Does the Scripture speak to the decision that I have to make? Does it give some kind of teaching and guideline on it? We should never make major life decisions haphazardly. Joseph doesn't do this. He puts deep, serious thought into what he should do. He's really considering all his options. He's weighing out what's the best thing to do. And being a just a righteous man, he believes in his heart he's chosen the right thing. So there's Joseph's dilemma, Joseph's determination, but then there's Joseph's dream. And in Joseph's dream, God is going to give Joseph clarification and confirmation. He's going to clarify to Joseph what is happening, and he's going to confirm that what Mary told him is true. She is, she is conceived of the Holy Spirit. She has not been unfaithful. She has not been immoral. She is definitely uh, telling the truth. So verses 20 through 23 is Joseph's dream. Now I broke down Joseph's dream to uh, one, the divine visitation, two, the divine revelation, and three, the divine prophecy fulfilled. So let's take this one at a time. First of all, the first part of verse 20, the divine visitation. Verse number 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. So the angel of the Lord comes to him. Now, this was a dream. He had a dream. But this don't think of this as a dream like you might have had last night. This was not abstract or are odd, or you're trying to figure out what things might mean. This is him in this dream state, and the angel of the Lord coming to him and giving him direction. Now, about five times, 
this is going to happen in uh, the next couple of chapters where the Lord is going to speak to him through the intervention of an angel, him and the wise men. That, uh, the angel of the Lord is going to come to him in a dream and speak to them. So about five times this is going to happen. Don't try to look for that to be a pattern and try to get God to speak to you with an angel coming to talk to you. We're not ever instructed to do that. In fact, Joseph wasn't instructed to do that. The angel came to him. We need to study the Word of God and prayerfully consider what God has said. Now, if God was to choose to manifest himself in some way, then that's God's business. But we're never to seek those manifestations. We are to seek God through his word, and then through this, his word, he will give us guidance and direction. So, you have the divine visitation, this angel comes to him. Now, the angel isn't named here. It's just called the angel of the Lord. But when you look at the accounts uh, in Luke's gospel, when an angel comes to Mary, it's the angel Gabriel. And I find this really interesting because Gabriel's last scene in the book of Daniel given Daniel uh, uh, messages from the Lord. In fact, he, he calls himself uh, uh, Gabriel, who stands before the presence of the Lord. It's like how Michael the archangel is a warrior, is a captain, is a leader of armies. Uh, Gabriel seems more like he is a messenger. His job is to deliver messages from the Lord. It kind of reminds me uh, in the military at headquarters, you would have people that had various responsibilities during their watch. One of the responsibilities was called messenger. And I remember a number of times, I, my responsibility was messenger. And as a messenger, I didn't make up my own messages. My responsibility was to take whatever my commanding officer had given me and then bring that to some other officer. And that was the messenger's job. His, messenger, his job was to deliver messages. So this angel is delivering this message. So we have the divine visitation, and now verses 20 through 21, the divine revelation. He is going to reveal to Joseph the program, God's plan and program that he has laid out. So he says, but while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. That which is conceived of her is of the Holy Ghost. What's interesting is this Greek word conceived, it, it also can be translated begotten, as begotten of the Holy Ghost, meaning this is the divine origin of this, this human body that Jesus is going to live in, God the Son is going to live in. And so, anyway, he tells David, the first thing he tells David is fear not. And you see that over and over again in the New Testament. When angels show up, people are afraid. They're, they're an incredible sight, and they're told, fear not. In general, considering everything that's going on in our world today, and there's a lot of things to be afraid of, the Bible t says the statement, fear not, it says it 365 times which is interesting because there's 365 days in a year. So for each day of the year, God tells us, fear not. And uh, beloved, that's one thing I don't want you to do in these troublesome times, is to let your heart be consumed with fear. The devil wants to do that because then he can control you through your fear. I know it's hard sometimes. I know it is difficult, but we've got to cast that off. And we've got to yield to God. And always remember, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. So if I have a spirit of fear, that, that did not come from God. Therefore, God doesn't want that in my life. So we, we, we have to remember that. And it gets fearful. Believe me, it gets fearful in the times in which we live. But God says, fear not. So he tells them, don't be afraid to take Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now notice verse number 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. 
So he's telling her, he's telling Joseph, listen, this is God's plan. This is exactly what's going to happen, Joseph. She is going to bring forth a son. And that son is going to be named Jesus. That's what you are going to call him. Now the name Jesus, you see how it's J-E and then S-U-S. And simply what that means is Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. Anytime somebody mentions the name of Jesus, this is what they're saying. Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. Just think of every time Jesus, somebody called out to Jesus in the Gospels, and they said, Jesus. And they were saying, Jehovah saves. Amen? Nothing else can save you but God himself. No church work, no uh, good works of any type, no being a good person. All that stuff may be nice and have its place, but none of that can save you. The only thing that can save you is Jehovah. Jehovah saves through the person of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice of the cross. And this is what the angel is leading up to. This is God's plan and program, Joseph. This is what you have to understand. And so once again in verse 21, And she, and she shall bring forth a son, and, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. This is his mission. His mission is to save his people from their sins. What did John the Baptist say when he saw uh, Jesus on the banks of the Jordan? He said to all the crowd, he said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen? And so Jesus' primary mission was to deliver us from our sins. And folks, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but if, this, if his mission is to deliver us from our sins, then it's probably a good thought that we should not wallow in sin. Sometimes people think, well, I'm saved, I'm forgiven, I'm on my way to heaven. That means I can live however I want. That's not what that means. If he came to deliver you from your sin, then that must have been a serious problem. And we as believers, we don't want to continue in the sin. We want to do the best that we can through the power of the Holy Spirit to walk holy lives. That's what God wants us to do. Uh, it's not always easy. We make mistakes, but God's even provided for the mistakes. He said if, uh, he said if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He says, he says, brothers, I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So if you stumble and fall, don't let the devil beat you down. Don't beat yourself down. Just confess it, brush yourself off, and keep on going. But understand, God has delivered us. Amen? He has delivered us. And we haven't experienced that full package yet. But one moment in his presence, wow, all things instantaneously made new. This sinful flesh will drop, and I will rise to seize the everlasting prize. It's, I get excited about this, folks, so forgive me, because I could go off into a salvation message right now so easily. But we've got to get back to Joseph. So the divine revelation about Jesus, he will save his people from their sins. Verse number 22 tells us, uh, verse number 21, verse number 22 is the divine prophecy fulfilled. So verse 20 was a divine visitation, the angel of the Lord appeared. Verses 20 and the last half of that verse to 21 is the divine revelation what Jesus is about. Why is he coming to the world? What is he going to do? And then... Uh, verses uh, 22 through 23, the divine prophecy fulfilled. All right, so let's look at verse 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us. So, the divine prophecy fulfilled is Isaiah 7, 14. And remember what I told you in the beginning, there's over 60 times that Matthew is going to quote the Old Testament 
in his gospel. And this is because he's proven the fulfillment that Jesus has of biblical prophecy over and over again. He's fulfilling biblical prophecy. Why does Jesus need to come into the world in the way that he does? Well, one of the reasons, reasons is because it's fulfilling biblical prophecy. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet Isaiah. And that's Isaiah 7.14. Here is the prophecy, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. A virgin is a woman that has never had sexual intimacy with anybody. Anybody. She is a virgin, but yet she has a child. I believe there's an Old Testament verse that talks about a woman encompassing a man, which is interesting, because in a roundabout way, that also could be a picture of the virgin birth, a woman encompassing a man. And so, behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God with us. So the very name of Jesus hints to his deity. He shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. If he's not God, then why call him God with us? He's God, called God with us because Jesus has ever been God. And there's a thing called the Trinity. People in the day in which we live try to deny the Trinity, but it's a biblical-based doctrine that is so simple, I don't see how you can miss it, how you can deny it. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three distinct personalities, yet uniquely one God together. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uniquely woven together. The three are one. The great I am. And here is Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. Now, let's move on to uh, the last two verses, verses 24 through 25, Joseph's direct obedience. Because up to this time, Joseph still has a choice to make. He can choose to take what the angel told him and believe God and act upon on what God said and, and actively do what God told him to do, or he could deny, he could reject it. He could say, I'm not going to do that. You've got to understand, uh, although this was a great privilege to help the ch Christ child to come into the world and help raise the Christ child, why that's a great pr privilege, it was going to come at a high price. Why? Why? Because of the scandal, for one. Uh, we talk about Mary having to deal with the scandal, so does Joseph have to deal with the scandal. Think about it. Here's a woman that claims that her child is that she's conceived of the Holy Ghost, that her, her, God is the father of her child. Now, when Joseph tells that to family and friends, the family and friends are going to be, are you really that stupid? Are you really that naive, Joseph? You're going to believe that? So there's this stigma. There is this problem. There's always going to be those that will be talking under the breath and making accusations. In fact, later on in the Gospels, as Jesus is an adult, they even throw this up at, at him at one point. They say, we know who our father is, as if insinuating he's illegitimate and he doesn't know who his father is. You see, what I'm telling you is that there was more to this story that was known than I think people really understand. And uh, so here is Joseph. He has to make a decision. This is an important decision. And he chooses to be obedient. And folks, it's always best to choose to be obedient to God, no matter what it is. It, you might not understand why God wants to do something the way he's doing it, but you need to be obedient to it. And even though the road is rough and hard and difficult, I believe that God is a debtor to no man. He'll pay you back, whether in this life or the life to come. But be willing to do what his will is. Amen? And so here's Joseph's direct obedience. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not. And I mean, they didn't have sexual relations, till she had brought forth her firstborn son. All right? 
Now, I say this all the time. If you have a firstborn, that means you also have a secondborn and a thirdborn. He, she brought forth her firstborn son. Mary would have other children after Jesus. If Mary was to be a perpetual virgin, virgin, all, a virgin all her life, then it would have said that brought forth the only begotten son. But it doesn't say that there. It says that, look at it again, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. It says he, she brought forth her firstborn son, not her only begotten son. Now, of God the Father, it is true that Jesus is his only begotten Son because he is the only one to come into the world uh, in the way that he did, offspring of God himself, if you will. But as far as Mary's concerned, no, Mary had other sons and daughters, and their names are given to us in the Word of God. Now, some people, because they don't want to believe the truth of the Word of God, and they want to believe that Mary was a perpetual version virgin, they come up with some crazy teaching. Some people try to say that when it talks about his brothers and sisters, he's talking about his cousins. Uh, that's not accurate at all because the word uh, for the brothers and sisters means to come from the same womb. All right, So those are literally his brothers and sisters. They would be his half-brothers and sisters because Joseph would have been their father and uh, Mary would have been their mother, and with Jesus, only Mary is his mother, and uh, Joseph is, is just uh, his stepfather, if you will. But uh, another lie that people propagate, I read this just last night in a Bible dictionary about drop the dictionary on the floor. Uh, but in this uh, case, the guy said that, uh, that uh, this was uh, Joseph's children by a former marriage. Where do you get this stuff? I mean, you have to absolutely make that up because there is no evidence that Joseph was much older than Mary, that Joseph was married before Mary, and that Joseph had other children. You have to make that up because there's no evidence for that anywhere. Listen, choose to believe the truth of the Word of God and not what some church tries to say is right. Listen, she, she was a virgin when she conceived and bring forth the Christ child into the world. But after she brought the Christ child into the world, her and Joseph had relations, and then they had other children together. And then even look at the structure of that verse. Talking about Joseph, it says, and knew her not till... Till, till, till is a timing event. He knew her not till... Till what? till she had brought forth her firstborn son. So insinuating that they did get together afterwards. So don't buy into these false doctrines, but let the Word of God teach you the truth of the Word of God. The thing we don't want to miss there is the fact that Joseph was obedient unto God. So we saw Joseph's dilemma, Joseph's determination, Joseph's dream, and Joseph's direct obedience. Now, by way of, I like to give these every now and then, I don't do it all the time, called life lessons. These are things I think about in my mind and then I write them down. And so I'm not going to preach on these, but I just want to throw these life lessons or these applications out there. First of all, perplexing moments in life may be by God's design. In other words, you may have a perplexing moment in your life you're not really sure what to do, a dilemma, if you will. It may be by God's design to cause you to dig deeper into the mind and the will of God. God doesn't want us having surface-level Christianity. He wants us to go deeper. And this dilemma that Joseph had caused him to go deeper. Two, a second life lesson. Like Joseph, there will be crossroads in life that demand decisions. We're going to come to these crossroads. Joseph was at a crossroad. He had to make a decision. You are going to have crossroads in your life where decisions have to be made. And I, should, I shouldn't be quoting Kung Fu. I know that. But it always comes to my mind. Choose wisely, grasshopper. Choose wisely. All right, so you'll be at crossroads. Three, like Joseph, 
there must be a willingness to surrender to God's plan for our life. There must be a willingness. Joseph had to be willing to surrender to, for God's plan for his life. God's plan for Joseph's life was to be the, the father of Jesus, the stepfather, if you will, of Jesus, to raise him and care and protect and provide for him in this life. This was God's plan for Joseph, and Joseph had to be willing to accept God's plan. We have to be willing to accept God's plan for our life. In other words, we need to be like Paul on the road to, to, to Damascus, and the Lord meets him, and he says to the Lord, he says, what wilt thou have me to do? And this is how we need to approach God. What will you have me to do? And then let God fill in the blank. What will you have me to do? When God called me to preach, that's where it all began. I said, God, what do you want me to do with my life? I'm, uh, I'm soon to get out of the Seabees in, in a year or two. What do you want me to do with my life? And it was at that point that the Lord began to call me into the ministry. Then a fourth thing is that we must understand that surrendering to God's plan may come at a high price. It may come at a high price. I believe for Joseph it did. It did come at a high price. For Mary also, for Mary and Joseph both, following God's call on their life to bring in the Christ child, though it was a great blessing, came at a high personal cost. But they were willing to pay that price. Why? Because you have to always remember God is a debtor to no man. Amen? He's a debtor to no man. He will, he will uh, take care of you. He will recompense you. He will give you a reward for your faithfulness, whether in this life or the life to come. That's his business. But no, God is a debtor to no man. So there's no price tag ever too high, theoretically, too high to pay in serving God. Literally, there is. It's not going to be easy, and there's going to be difficulties. But like the hymn that we sing here at church, it will be worth it all. There will be difficulties. It will not be easy, but it will be worth it all. So, what's God calling you to do? What he want you to do with your life? For Joseph, he had a plan and a purpose. And here's Joseph, our unsung hero of Christmas. No one ever talks about him. No one hardly even acknowledges him. But this morning we did, because I don't want him to go unnoticed, because he's a vital part. And folks, you might not believe this, but you also are a vital part in God's plan. God has a purpose, you know, will, a desire, and a direction for you. And you need to find out what that is and follow it. The first thing is salvation. If you've never come to a point in your life where you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's where it begins with you. You say, but if I get saved, people will make fun of you. Remember what I said. There's a price tag. There's a high price to pay sometimes. I know the heat of professing yourself to be a Christian and having friends and family kind of not necessarily completely turn their back on you, but really just not wanting to have to do, not wanting to have anything to do with you because you're walking two separate paths. I thank God that all my family, my brothers, my sisters have come to faith in Jesus Christ and, and they uh, serve him now the best that they can. But I got to tell you folks, there is this price to come with being a Christian. Not everybody is going to be happy with your decision. But don't worry about them. Because your eternity depends on what you choose to do with Jesus. Will you receive him as your Lord and Savior? Will you come to him believing that you are a sinner, that you deserve to die and go to hell, that that's your eternal destiny? Because that's truly what the Bible says is the destiny for every man. And then with that knowledge, look to Jesus and say, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Put all your faith and trust in the finished work of Christ, the death, burial, and the resurrection. This is what it takes to be saved. It takes to look to Jesus. Look and live. My brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Listen, I'm telling you. 
If you've never received Christ as your Savior, now's the time to do it. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the moment you need to call out to God, have mercy upon me, a sinner, trusting only Him and what He has done. And then if you're a believer, now is the time for you to give out, sell out for God, just go all out for Jesus Christ. And let this Christmas season mark the beginning of not a new year, but a new life for you, a new life of walking with the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the Holy Word of God. And I just pray, Father, that anyone out there that doesn't know you, they would give their heart and their life to you, and that even now they would believe and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I pray for those of us who are saved, that they also would give their heart and their life to you. There's no better life than to live for you, Lord. It's difficult, hard, it's not always easy, but there's no better life than to live for you. And I pray that for everyone that names the name of Christ. Oh God, help us to be what we should be for your glory and for your honor. Thank you for the way that you use Joseph and the way that you uh, work in and through his life. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen. All right. So this